Yes, so welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us for our fourth and final webinar. Um, today we're talking about theory storming innovative sustainable design and Yvonne and Tobias are going to do most of the talking and I'll um, mediate or moderate the chat a little bit at the end. Um, so before we start, we just want to um, acknowledge, uh, QUT wants to acknowledge the traditional owners, the Turbo and Yagura people as the First Nations owners of the lands where QT now stands. We pay respect to their elders, lores, customs, and creation spirits, and we recognize that these lands have always been places of teaching, research, and learning. QT acknowledges the important role Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people play within the QT community. Okay, so if we uh, remember where we started, so week one was salutogenic health promoting places. Um, then week two, we had innovative child-friendly design. That was our um, crazy one with the <laughs> Zoom bummer <laughs> that we all experienced. Uh, then week, last week, uh, just last week, was innovative age-friendly and inclusive design. And then today is our final one, and it's innovative sustainable design. So if we all remember, um, these are based on sort of the key priorities, the global priorities that we talked about in, in the book creating great places. And we did want to announce actually the winner of the book. I, if you all remember, we were going to, um, anybody who was here all four sessions would uh, get a book. And I, it was our guest from uh, Singapore. Yen Lin? Yeah, Yen Lin. Yen Lin. She happens to not be logged on yet. Oh, oh no, she did every, every single time. <laughs> Darn it. Okay, well, we'll make sure she comes with this next one. Uh, she's three out of four. Right. The winner didn't sign in on the last session. Wow. <laughs> if anyone else feels they've been at all four and we've missed it, drop us an email. <laughs> um, okay, so we'll, we'll move on. <laughs> So for today, what we're going to do is uh, we'll do just a brief recap and introductions again. Um, then Tobias is going to talk about innovative, sustainable design. And then Yvonne is actually going to talk about the global priority that we mentioned about sustainable design and how it fits into uh, theory storming. And then we'll do the discussion, uh, well, the th theory storming and using the example of a green roof. And then finally, we'll have a discussion lounge and um, talk about next steps and what you can do or what we can all do actually as next steps and kind of how to make sure we're sort of putting some of this in practice. Okay, so um, just a little recap. You probably all know this by now, but so I'm Deb Cushing. So I'm the discipline leader in spatial design here at QT in the School of Design and my background is landscape architecture and I do research on healthy and child friendly, healthy child and youth friendly environments. And so Yvonne, if you'd like to. Hi, share. I'm Yvonne Miller. Um, I'm professor of design psychology and director of the QT Design Lab. So my background, you know, as my title says, is in the area of sort of psychology and people's engagement with places, particularly um, age friendly design, so aged care and sustainability. So I'll be leading us as we lead through this conversation today about, about sustainability. So we've said all along this month that the decisions we make as designers, as creators, as policy makers, uh, as I guess strategic thinkers about the design of our built environment, these decisions are really, really important because they facilitate or hinder at the health and well-being of our communities. Great places don't just happen. They are created and they're created intentionally, intentionally and, and consciously. So we need to create them with thought um, and we need to use all the best evidence that we can to create these places. And so Deb and I have come up with this idea that we're calling theory storming, whereby we theory storm based on theories. So we actually use evidence-based design solutions to come up with some ideas about how we might move forward. So we have drawn on six critical design theories. Remember affordance theory, so cue to behavior, prospect refuge, that ability to see um, and to take refuge with something, personal space. We're all aware of the need for personal spaces in, in the pandemic times. Sense of place, that sense of connection you have to a place, a sense of history or the genius loci, place attachment, building bonds with places, and of course, biophilic design theory. So thinking about the importance of nature and green spaces and animals and living things uh, in, as we design 
And so we've used these theories to theory storm how we might design places in a way that draws on evidence-based theory. And today I'm going to focus on sustainable design, which is it's a contested topic for many, but it increasingly is part of uh, daily practice for designers. And it's got a number of, of terms and definitions, including environmentally sustainable design, environmentally conscious design, eco design, green design, net zero, um, or net positive design. And it's the philosophy of thoughtfully designing objects and environments that reduce and ideally eliminate all the negative environmental impacts. So what I'm going to do now is hand over to Tobias and he's going to talk a little bit um, about some ideas. Awesome. Thanks, Yvonne. And welcome, everybody. Thanks for zooming in. Can you see it? Is it coming through? We can see it. Beautiful. So firstly, quick introduction. My name is Tobias, Tobias Wolbert from Germany. I studied in Hanover and actually my passion or my, my final degree within landscape architecture was in sustainability. So I was lucky, I started in Hanover where we had in 2000 the Sustainability Expo. So we had amazing like um, um, eco-friendly houses and districts and did a lot of studies on eco-friendly developments, I guess. I'm also the co-founder of the Seven Senses Foundation. My wife is an occupational therapist, so really passionate about inclusive design beyond accessibility. And I work for Urban Play as a play consultant. And Urban Play is really passionate about, I guess, um, making parks destinations and really bringing the whole community and, and, and everybody together to, to, to play, to enjoy, and to really engage with nature and with each other. We are a Queensland-based company, and um, we're doing Queensland and Northern Territory, and we do the design and construction of um, all play environments like the, the, the shade, the, the rubber, the play, the fitness, the skate, like everything that has to do with fun, we can actually do. So pretty exciting field to be in and to combine that with sustainability. I guess, as I said, like my passion is for sustainability since I'm probably 12 years old. I started um, biology was my thing at school. And then, as I said, with landscape architecture, I really focused on sustainable developments. When I came to Australia, I worked for a company called Sustainable. So I built sustainable houses. And I actually just built my own sustainable house three years ago. And was really to look at how do we challenge what is normal? and how do we actually make smarter choices. So for me, sustainability is not about sacrifice. It's not about having dreadlocks and being a tree hugger. It's actually being smarter. And the thing is all about the design. It's all about the planning. So if we plan smarter and um, design smarter, that's how we actually tickle all the things that sustainability is all about. So um, I will use actually a little bit of my sustainable house development um, and then combine that with what we do from a playground perspective. I like this quote, we don't inherit the earth from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children. So I guess, again, in this society, it's, it's very selfish and sometimes we are very short-term thinkers. So even like this whole movement on, um, let's say again, from the house perspective to have solar panels, if it doesn't pay off within three years, people are not doing it because normally within three years, they made money on the house and they're selling it off. So they're not building a home, they're actually building an investment to then get to the next phase. So, but when we look at a 25 year life cycle analysis, obviously to make, to get, for example, solar panels on makes a lot of sense. I put like a 6.8 kilowatt solar system on and I paid it off now in three years. And now I'm actually, making money from a um, profit point of view, but it's also good for the environment. And I actually um, run my house with um, 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 zero energy from, from the grid. So I guess sustainability and parks works really nicely together because when we look at the sustainable um, triple bottom line or the, 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 the three Ps, actually that's what parks do. So they are really good for, from a social perspective, they are really good from an economic one because obviously they are bringing um, people together. They actually make people stay longer. So there's a lot of research when we have a really beautiful park, they actually house prices increase, but obviously the local businesses do better as well because people stay there, they need an ice cream and all this stuff. And then environmentally it's great because we're increasing the biodiversity if we do it correct. If we don't just cut the entire side and put everything level and then put the new artificial world on it, if we do it, um, if, we, if we touch 
the site lightly, if we use the existing vegetation, and again, if we use theory storm, like bi biophilic design uh, methodologies and theories, then we actually achieve something that's beautifully from the environment, makes money, but it's also a social connection. So I think parks itself are a great sustainability approach um, that we should invest more in and make sure that these parks are for everyone and are really considered um, holistically and not just, oh, here's another A, B, and C. We do A here and then, oh, we have a bit more money. We do the B ones here. So it really needs to encourage all the theories that, that you guys are, have published in your book. Again, from this uh, sustainability triangle, from the social and stuff. So the other thing is the three Ps. So profit, planet, and people. Again, I just explained that with, with the parks, but I think one thing that is always missing is really the education. And there's so much research as well that um, when, when people don't know, for example, um, or haven't experienced a beautiful rainforest, they don't know what they are protecting. So the other thing is as well, like when, when we are passionate about sustainability and doing the right things, how do we educate? How do we actually make the decision makers aware that they can make an informed decision? So what does it actually mean if I buy something from the $2 shop, like a vacuum cleaner? Again, the throwaway society, we're buying a vacuum cleaner because it's really cheap, and in six months, it, it doesn't work anymore. Oh, no worries, I just bring it to the landfill and then I buy a new one. So is that a sustainable model? No, but do we actually understand what it means if I invest a little bit more, as I said, with the solar panels, but then when we look at a 25-year life cycle analysis, it actually saves us money, it's better for the environment, we have less waste. The other challenge I always put out there, how we measure, for example, waste. So we measure it on weight, which doesn't make sense to me. Like if I have an entire container full of foam, that's a lot of waste, but it weights nothing. So for me, it's really looking at how do we measure, for example, weight, uh, waste should be on, on volume versus weight, how it's actually calculated at the moment. So I think we have to challenge ourselves when we make um, sustainable assessments as well. So. Again, it's a little bit like salutogenic design, like all these bigger, like um, um, global topics that we discussed, obviously, over the last four weeks are all very complex ones. And um, they can't be solved or, 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 or done in, by, by one profession. Even. So I think it's really about collaborating and listen to the experts and, and putting the heads together to get the best possible solutions. But it's also looking at things like durability, safety, and the question of the lifespan. So how long, as I just said, with this um, vacuum cleaner, how long does something hold and what are the warranties and what are, so it's a little bit, um, um, I guess, more material based, but I think it's still very important and a lot of people don't look at that. So it's the materials that we choose and it's what happens after the end of life. So where do the materials go? What do we do with them? So for one, um, they need to be responsible sourced. So for example, Comp and we have all like certified um, FSC certified timbers that we are using. They're all like sustainable, uh, sustainable sourced. The production chain, we actually have, um, 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 what is it called again? Um, a sustainable um, production chain that we actually get it carbon neutral here from overseas to, to get it here. So we have a full carbon offset um, program and then made from recycled materials. So 70% of all our um, equipment is made out of um, recycled materials and 95% can be recycled after its lifespan. And again, when you look at our warranties, I, I just found that amazing life, lifetime warranty. And for example, on, on row, some have two years warranty, we have 10 years. So it's really like, yes, it's an investment, but then it can stay for a long, long time. You really bring a lot of joy to the families using it. So I just mentioned the end of life, 95% um, recyclable content. The, the, the profits, a lot of them need to go back to the right causes as well. So company invested that a lot in like research and evidence to produce new innovative ways, how we can actually engage with the with, with community. And I'll show some examples there. Again, with my house, for example, in regards to innovation, um, all my walls are a thermal chimney. So I designed the walls that there's between the cladding and the actually um, insulation, there's an air gap. So the best insulation is moving air. So the cold air gets sucked in and the hot air gets pumped out. So my entire house is constantly breathing. So through that, I don't have aircon and heating. So again, how can we use innovative things like that 
in the play environment as well. So we, I'll show you some examples there shortly. Another thing, as I just mentioned, this whole throwaway society, and I think that's so scary. And, and again, it's, it's actually now, that's a good thing with the coronavirus that we suddenly see like a lot of stuff coming from overseas that we can't get now. So we really have to look at what, what can we do um, to actually make sure what we buy holds longer and does need to be replaced in one or two years time. And then our landfill is growing bigger and bigger and bigger. So making the right choices and picking the right materials that we put in, in, into our built environment. Um, again, just um, looking, looking at the landfill, it's still incredible like how much goes into landfill here. So it, it, it's really keeping an eye on that and understanding what that means. In regards to people, sustainability is all about like the education, as I mentioned, like we are really young, young team here at Urban Play. We are all pretty passionate about sustainability. A lot of us grow their own food. We do our recycling, like little things like that, but they help already. Then when we do some projects like, like I do with my kids every year, we do the Greening Australia Day, so we do the tree planting day, so to just get your hands dirty and put that in. I did a playground, still remember in Nambour, where we partnered with Greening Australia, and we actually got heaps of plants in, and the, and the kids, because it was so hard to get them engaged to actually build the playground, because from health and safety and all this stuff, but to plant a tree, everybody can do it. So we got all these little cubes, and they planted the trees, and actually there was zero vandalism, because again, the sense of place is, place um, um, attachment came through being physically part of building these things. So it's, uh, we, we spend a lot of time here in the office talking about sustainable initiatives and how we can help each other. And then I, I guess the, the, the play to learn is a beautiful thing because in the parks, we can actually give, give little, little incentives for example, and, 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 and little clues for the kids as well to think about sustainability. Like in childcare centers to have like water pumps that are connected to a tank that has a clear, clear panel. So suddenly there's no water coming. Kids go like, what's going on? There's no water. Well, there was no rain. So there's actually no water. So they actually learn about these, the, these things from a sustainability point of view. Like, oh, how do we harvest the water? How do we, are we more sensible with the water use? That's another thing as well. How do we slow down our overland flow rather than getting these big spoon drains and just getting rid of the water? So again, with the design, we can do all these things, but, but we can also in a play environment, making that in miniature and in very innovative um, 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 design facets that the kids learn through play. And go like, oh, didn't even understand that, 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 that the water is flowing this way or that the water needs to stay in this area. As I mentioned with innovation, with my thermal chimneys and things like that at home, I think company again, like they invested so much over the last few years in, um, in proper fitness. And what, what we found, like there's a lot of fitness equipment out there um, in the world and a lot of that doesn't get used because it doesn't really work on, on, on your cardio, on your actually muscle use. So their vision was to develop like a bike and a cross trainer that is better than an indoor one for the outdoors. But the nice thing is as well, it doesn't need any like electricity or support or anything like that. So it's actually fully self powered. So while you're spinning on this bike, it actually powers your screen and then you can connect it to an app and you can do the Tour de France. So you can actually go up and down the hill and you can actually race with friends from somewhere else. So there's um, a really beautiful benefit how to use sustainable, innovative, equipment to actually raise this awareness about it as well and the nice thing as i said it's just a bull down so it can go anywhere we don't need to have facilities with solar panels like nothing needs to be powered so it's it's really all part of that innovative piece so to wrap it up goes back to where i started alone we can do so little together we can do so much more so it's really about the collaboration we have to put our heads together like but the key thing is really i've I think sustainability comes not from the sacrifice, actually comes from the design to be smart, why we're we putting the things where we put them and then to follow through with the other things. Yeah, what kind of materials do we use? What kind of plantings do we put in? How do we do all these things? But the key thing is to, to start from a planning perspective and get the right, right heads together. Thank you. Right. Back to the coffee cup. Ah. Awesome. I have, have you in sharing, Tobias? I can share oh, yes. mine. Sorry. Sorry. The joys of Zoom. Actually, we're getting pretty good at this, I think. Um, hang on. I say that, I'm going to jinx myself. Ah. Hang on. Can you guys see that? Hopefully. I just need to flick to the... 
Here we are. So, um, Tobias Miss Mate, I love, can I just say that I love that notion of um, parks doing a triple bottom line assessment. So looking at, you know, profit, uh, people and planet on parks and then tying in ice cream sales and coffee sales and things like that. I think there's actually a bit there about, and particularly um, we know that building values go up. That's really good. That a lot. So um, and let's take a step back uh, to where this all started. I think most people will be familiar with the Brundtland Report from the United Nations a while now, 30 years ago, that defines sustainable development is that we can't, we need to meet the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And out of that became John Alkerton's three, three Ps, where he's talked about people, profit, and planet, and how we need to think about all of those three things when we're developing things. Uh, most recently, Richard Branson, so the Virgin CEO, and a few other, um, he leads a few other organizations, has launched what is called the B Team Initiative. And I really like this because they're talking about how big business, and all businesses need to move away from plan A, which is focused on profit, to plan B, whereby, it's a realization that businesses can't thrive when workplaces and communities are failing just as it can't succeed on a planet that's failing. So the argument is that, you know, we've all got to do this together uh, and we need to create, you know, rather than profit being the primary motive, we need to think about more broadly about a broader social good because business doesn't do well when a planet's not doing well and people and communities aren't doing well. And it's a really great, it's a great way of thinking about things. So the B team initiatives got a number of um, guidelines and stuff. If you are interested, you can find a little bit more about uh, their initiative. And of course, uh, we can't talk about sustainability without talking about the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. But they're all great, uh, from no poverty to zero hunger to climate action uh, to partnerships and clean energy and clean water. These kind of goals are out there for us to transform our world. Um, but despite all of these kind of, you know, despite these personal passions and multiple global environmental policy initiatives, progress towards sustainability has not been very good at all. Uh, former United Nations Secretary General Bani Ka Moon talked about it as being uneven and insufficient. And I do want to briefly uh, read the current United Nations Secretary General's remarks on climate change because I think they make a really good point. And sometimes we don't stop to realize that really climate change is quote, the defining issue of our time and we're at a defining moment. So he's often asked, you know, what are the priorities? And he says, uh, there are many priorities in the United Nations, peace and security, human rights and development. But I would say this climate change is the absolute number one priority because climate change is running faster than we are. And if we, if we don't act very quickly, we'll, we won't be able to, um, won't be able to act because of the irreversible damage that we're that we're that we are um placing on our planet um and it's sometimes you feel like yeah you made that point tobias about being the crazy hippie crazy you know with the dreadlocks and stuff but actually it's just about being a responsible citizen and thinking what harm is there to behaving a little bit sustainability there's no harm do you know what i mean and there may be many many benefits so as designers and creatives we have to rise to this challenge and we can you know, and be part of the solution, not the problem. Uh, now, over, gosh, nearly over a decade, nearly 15 years ago now, John Thackeray wrote this book about how to thrive in the next economy, designing tomorrow's world, and makes the point that designers potentially are guilty of killing the planet because 80% of the environmental impact of products and buildings that surround us is determined at the design stage. And we have to respond to that. We could either argue it, cringe with guilt, or become, you know, change makers, do you know what I mean? Uh, be a transformative form for good. And really that's our challenge to set that bar quite high um, and be part of a positive transformation. So of course, uh, Tobias touched on this on, on, on transitioning to a circular economy. So right now we're pretty much a linear economy and we take, make, throw away. We're a little bit recycling not enough but what we need is a circular economy uh, where things are designed to be reused right from the beginning and we need to shift the needle uh, on, on these approaches we can do that particularly with climate 
uh, with green buildings. So there's a lot of a lot of work on green buildings and the notion that the buildings that we build and live in and work in can nurture instead of harm, can restore, can inspire instead of constrain, can make the world a better place to live. So traditionally, I think we're all pretty familiar with this that buildings are pretty resource heavy, uh, but they can be. Um, inspirational and actually give back more than they take in terms of their operation and construction. So the World Building, World Green Building Council has actually linked uh, the construction of green buildings with sustainable development goals. And you can see this here about how green buildings compared to conventional buildings can improve people's health and well-being, you know, can use affordable and alternative energy um, and can do a number of other things that are quite positive. But beyond sort of green and net zero buildings, that is buildings that you know um, are sort of neutral in their impact on the world, we get, there's a movement uh, which I really like a lot towards what's called restorative or regenerative buildings, which is that buildings we design buildings and spaces and places that give back more than they take. Okay, so they actually are um, you know they do a calculation about their you know what it costs to build them in terms of consumption of energy and building materials, and then actually um, figure out a way to make sure that they give back more than they take in terms of energy and water use, uh, which is really wonderful. Um, and I put in the chat before the Living Building Challenge, and this is a very good resource if you're not familiar with it. So this is very much uh, about raising the bar uh, so that this, this visionary kind of regenerative design becomes more mainstream. And the Living Building Channel Challenge is centered around a petal or a flower. Um, and within the flower, each, there's um, seven petals and each petal represents a different domain to try and aim for. And they're a little bit unusual. I really like them because of that. So one of the petals here is beauty. Uh, so the building or the, or the place or the space has to uplift the human spirit. Another pedal was about equity. So how does it support social justice and well-being? Uh, another one is about health and happiness. How does it optimize well-being? So there's a really, the Living Building Challenge is a really great example of metrics and performance um, guidelines, I guess, that are designed to raise the bar and help us think differently in a really beautiful and proactive way about the places and spaces that we're designing. You know, <laughs> And too often uh, we get not great spaces. Actually, I was, I don't know when the heck we're going to be able to, us in Australia, travel to Europe again, but I was in London and I went to Sky Garden a couple of years ago. Um, it's a high rise building, sort of in a CBD of London area. And part of the reason it was allowed to be, to be built was because of the provision that it would provide a public park. So that was very much part of its, uh, its um, you know, its planning approval processes. Uh, the reality has not been that great, actually. A lot of people would say that this is not really a public park in many ways. So to access it, first off, you've got to book online at least three days before. You've got to queue like you would at the airplane, go through security, and you've got to show ID to get up. And there's really crowded lifts. And it's, yeah, I would agree, it is an un it's very much an underwhelming three-level garden. It's barely a garden. It's got good views, but it's barely a garden. So whilst this building has been awarded a lot of sustainability uh, credentials, I don't think it would get a Living Building Challenge equity pedal um, because it's a place that keeps people apart. So others, Wildeen and more, have written about how it's not a park because it's not a place where adults or children could walk, walk a dog, jog, have picnics or, or play or anything. And it's it's just too small. Um, so it's a real, and additionally, um, it's just, it keeps people out rather than bringing them together. So it's a really good example of how the intent sometimes in planning schemes in terms of sustainability and community engagement and public space sometimes doesn't turn into the reality um, and that we need to demand more uh, for in our buildings and in our plannings. Um, and maybe we need to say, yeah, let's make the living building challenge or similar uh, approaches to thinking about um, how we assess sustainability. Let's make them more mainstream. So here's an example of, um, this is in Pittsburgh. It's, I haven't been here, but it looks pretty cool. So it's got, there's a lot of, um, and it's got a number of these living building uh, challenge pedals uh, in particular, 
for uh, this example here is the Nature Lab, which is a sustainable and modular classroom. So apparently one in three US schools has a modular classroom and pretty much they're not very well designed and not very sustainable. And I imagine it would be similar statistic uh, here in Australia. Um, so what they've done is to try to create a learning space that is net positive in energy, net zero water, built with non-toxic materials, but also tries to be beautiful and engage people with that journey of sustainability. So Tobias mentioned um, experiential learning for kids in spaces. So this has got an example of showing rainwater capture and process. It's a tank in the classroom that kids can open and look at. It's got an observational beehive and a ladybug house, all those kind of things that kind of engages children uh, with nature and learning and sustainability and that kind of connection to planet and place and it also has an equity or a social justice pedal and it offers some paid internships to low-income uh, students so when we think about though sustainability and sustainable design i really um think we can't think about it without thinking about biophilic design that notion that you know connection to nature is healing um and is is so important. Um, that's why we want to go to parks. You know, it's why we enjoy and get so much out of being, you know, visiting the beach or the you know, this local stream or a garden. Um, and I always like to remind ourselves that we have always historically slept close to nature, lived in nature. Do you know what I mean? Like slept on rocks and caves and under trees. You know, only what 200 years ago in 1800, only 3% of us lived in an urban area. Now more than half of us, nearly 68% of us live in an urban space. So we have historically had this close connection to nature and it's been broken by urbanization and we need to, we need to intervene. Um, if you haven't read any of Timothy Beatley's books, I highly recommend them. They're a really great conversation, uh, really well um, illustrated with pictures and stories and narratives of practical ways that we can integrate biophilic design that is thinking about nature into our planning and design of buildings and spaces and build and places. Um, it's pretty much the forerunner in this field um, and well worth looking into if you want to know a bit more about biophilic design and why and how we can integrate biophilic design principles into any kind of design project. I think I mentioned this the other week. Um, we know that nature is good for us. You know, research has shown it that, you know, if you live closer to a park, if the place is greener, um, you're less likely to have depression. Short walk in nature will reduce, um, you know, reduce um, a brain scan afterwards, shows reduced neural activity in the area linked to mental illness. And simply sitting in a hospital rooftop forest for 12 minutes, lowered your heart rate enough so that you were really, really relaxed, even in a hospital setting. So there's a lot of ex great experiments that show nature is healing. So we need more contact with nature. And of course, Roger York's famous study that showed that patients in hospital, if you viewed trees versus brick walls, you were healed quicker um, and you were you know, less complaining, according to the nurse's notes. Um, but the reality is that most hospital patients and most aged care residents only get a few minutes of focused attention from doctors and nurses and allied health staff, but they're in their room, bed or chair for hours. And that's true if you think about the last time you were at a hospital, you're kind of sitting around waiting for somebody to treat you. And that's not to demean um, the hardworking staff in hospitals, it's just to acknowledge the reality of a stressed out healthcare system. So we need to design buildings that are sustainable and biophilic. Um, and this has been an argument for a long time. I just need to move my here we are, move my screen so I can read my own PowerPoint. Um, in the aged care space that I work in a lot, um, Bill Thomas is well known for, for discussing alternate ways of doing things, uh, and particularly put forward the Eden alternative that said that we need to redesign aged care so that it was living. So it's like a garden of Eden, it had animals and nature. Um, and he, he made this argument about how, I'll quote, that we might feel it a stab of guilt we often experience as we leave a person in a nursing home. How different might it feel if when we walked in, we immediately felt welcome and alive. If we felt we were leaving that person in an environment that nurtured them in our absence. And for that matter, how much more likely might friends or family be to visit? And I think that's a really good point that if we can create great places, places that um, uplift us, you know, so that are sustainable and biophilic, then it's wonderful for not only the occupants, but if we can turn places that are traditionally seen as 
I don't know, undesirable in quotation marks, such as aged care, if we could redesign them to be attractive and vibrant and beautiful and restorative, then we might actually change how they're viewed in society. And it's really important. Um, and we are increasingly doing that, whether it's through images of nature um, or um, there's this great resource online um, by uh, Browning and colleagues, the 14 Patterns of Biofit Design, which talks about how you can integrate nature into all kinds of projects. So they talk about nature and space, so gardens and plants and green roofs and living walls and water features, natural analogies to the patterns and materials of nature and the nature of the space, so how we might lay it out. Um, it's got some great tips and tricks uh, if you are interested in doing that, and it's a free resource online. Um, this is a wonderful example of a sustainable uh, aged care facility. I mentioned this the other week, but this week I want to focus on the sustainability of it. Let me just find my notes so that I'm correct. Uh, so it won the 2015 World Architecture Festival category um, and the American Architecture Prize for Healthcare Architecture because of the choice of building materials and texture and color response to the surrounding landscape and the play of light. Outdoor fire pits allow the community to come together to cook bush foods. There's waterfalls that cascade from the roof after rain through strategic located box gutters. Water then is celebrated as a feature rather than considered to be a problem that's discarded through drainage. Uh, so that's an example of celebrating that sense of place. Um, of that. It's also co-located next door to a school, so there's a connection, and it really is designed to capture the winds um, and to celebrate the local environment. It is a wonderful example of, of designing places to be sustainable and biophilic and magical rather than being, you know, boring and bland. Um, uh, so my colleague, Lindy Burton and I, who's an architect, uh, talked about how, uh, all the sort of domains that work here. So there's natural materials that are being used, such as rammed earth. Um, the elevated floor plane um, provides deep cooling, natural cooling at a ground level, so people can sit underneath. Uh, there's kind of light through a central atrium and a narrow building footprint, and it's really attached and thinks about um, cultural considerations. And the bedrooms overlook tree canopies. Uh, so it's this kind of this real celebration of place and space. Uh, which makes it a beautiful place to be in. And I love this suggestion that if we could build a building that was biophilic and sustainable, it's good for people on the planet. Imagine if we created an aged care facility like this, then not only would it be good for the residents in there, but also it has a positive impact on the lives of others, from the next door neighbours to people living on the other side of the globe. If we could create and all live in sustainable places, not only is it good for us, it's good for everybody. And I think that's just something we need to do much more of. And I want to end, I've got a few more examples, but I'm getting close to the end and then we'll do some theory storming. Um, this is Amazon Spears in Seattle. You can see they've actually got a bird's nest on the inside. Cool, right? And so there's increasingly, we're seeing these kind of things whereby organizations are looking at creating and working in and operating and being in a sustainable building as part of their commitment to the planet and commitment to the world so that ability to give back and it's a it's a brand thing um and you know a brand and a marketing and positioning thing and i think uh we can tap into that about part of being part of that global narrative for a force for change um and so when we talk about designing places and and, and green spaces uh, and access to green spaces, from for, particularly for the workforce, we can talk about um, what well, my colleague Andrew Patiscri talked about, the ethics of care towards a workforce. So if we, if we care for our workforce, then we should design a space that supports them, that mitigates stress. So let's have, and makes it is more positive. So we need to reimagine these spaces, uh, aged care in particular, and healthcare, but all spaces, so that they are regenerative and salutogenic, so health promoting and sustainable. So instead of being, you can see in the bottom there, that's pretty much a standard aged care facility. Um, we could create something that's much more, has a much more positive impact on the, law, on, on the world that we live in. So at, when we began this seminar, we talked about how we ran a couple of theory storming uh, workshops uh, with the Queensland Department of Housing, Homelessness and Sport, and we all put different hats on. And a lot of those were about you know, biophilic design and sustainable design, but also playable design and taking the perspective of other people. Um, and we've talked a lot about how we 
if we are to have a positive impact on the planet and the world and make a make the different make a the difference that we want to make then we need to do that with evidence and we can do that through design theory storming we can we can build on what we know works and and design great places so i want to just briefly walk through how we might design a green roof uh, through the lens of theory so here's a green roof you can see already you can see the benefit of a green roof like first off it looks beautiful compared to a standard roof um, so this is what we we want to see more of this in our built environment but we can create a green roof that's a little bit more thoughtful uh, if we engage with theory. So this is a photograph um, from Mr. Stork rooftop bar actually in Singapore. So this is more kind of quirky than um, sustainable. However, it does, you can see these teepees that provide a little place, space that people can re retreat to. So it provides a little bit of prospect refuge and a little bit of personal space. So the use of outdoor furniture uh, to provide a need for personal and social spaces in a, in a green roof. Uh, we have here, let me just move this. Oh, that's right. It's in Thailand. It's actually, they transform the existing roof of the university area, transformed an unused rooftop into a productive farm. Um, and they've really focused here on the sense of place and genius loci because I've designed it specifically to mimic uh, rice paddy fields. Okay, so um, that kind of sense of belonging of a local place. Um, they're also, as well as urban farming, there's a solar roof and there's a lot of green public space here and what had been just neglected space. Oh, hang on, sorry, I'm just struggling to move my mouse forward. Come on. Oh, there we are. Um, of course, here we are, America. It's the grassy hilltop roof of the California Academy of Sciences. And it's purposely designed to sort of, you know, have that kind of rolling rooftop to reflect the iconic hilly topography of San Francisco. Um, and it's got seven dramatic hills on top. So again, that sense of place is different. So we see rolling hall, hill, a green roof that's designed for rolling halls or a green roof that's designed for rice paddies. Um, it gives us that sense of local space. Place attachment. Uh, this is an example from Sydney. Uh, the St. Canisters had it's an inner city church, but it has a rooftop garden specifically for the refugees that it works with, and they run and operate it. So creating this kind of special place. Uh, and we can do that with green roofs much more than we do right now. There could be community gardens or community hub, um, a shared tool library or book swapping or something. It could be activated and, and so that there is a sense of a sense of place uh, that develops. And of course, affordances. Um, I always like my playful affordances, so the kind of fun ones, so a thing like a basketball hoop. Um, we don't see that very often on green roofs, places of gyms and activities. We should be doing that much more, whether it's chess or who knows what. Um, and so we can have those connections and tackle social isolation. So we can redesign you know, green roofs through the, lines of, through the lens of theory and create spaces that people want to be in much more than they do currently. And of course, our bike design, um, you know, making sure the space where birds and insects and fish and animals are visible and are seen. Uh, this example from a book, Living Architecture, Green Roofs and Walls. Uh, it's in New Zealand. And you can see that the, that the space, the building is, is just tucked into the landscape. It's really lovely. Uh, and, you know, we can create, um, you know, we can integrate use biophilia to translate really unremarkable spaces into green spaces. Uh, you know, whether it's the roof of a substation or the roof of a, um, of a bus stop, as we talked about the other week, or a bike shed. So that is we are at the end of our four week journey through theory storming uh, great places and what a journey i'm going to hand over to deb to do the end golly wow <clears throat> thanks yvonne that was awesome it was really good um good images and i mean overall both of you um really good things to think about so i think that was really excellent so um, yes, so we've gone through all of the four uh, global priorities that we have brought up in the book. So, uh, salutogenic environments, child-friendly design, age-friendly inclusive, and innovative sustainable design. So I think, and they're all connected. So as you saw um, from our presentations that uh, we didn't just leave one, we kind of had to repeat a little bit because all of these topics are connected and all of the theories and the theory storming 
um, approach um, can be applied to multiple different um, topics or issues that we're dealing with. So. <clears throat> okay, so um, in 2018, the University of Oxford had a seminar and it was called, Is Designing Healthy Communities the Right Response for an Overstretched um, NHS? So, uh, as you know, design is now a central part of the public health discourse. England's National Health Service um, created these 10 healthy new towns, and we talk about them actually in our book. Um, so these are demonstrator sites. And the CEO actually talked about, um, uh, he's quoted saying, um, we would kick ourselves if we missed the opportunity to design out the obesogenic environment and design in health and well-being. So the idea that we really need to start from the um, beginning when we're planning and designing these spaces, when, especially like a new town, um, and really figure out how to design it right so that it's for all health and well-being, all inclusive of all different age groups. Um, we, we look at all the different topics, um, biophilia, making sure everything is, um, you know, promoting uh, a sense of place and place attachment and all the different theories. Um, so we wanted to ask, if you were in charge of the healthcare system, what would you change? Um, and also, um, you know, is it, was this the right thing to do? And, you know, we would agree, um, and hopefully you would all agree, that yes, we need to start thinking um, kind of more holistically about this. And really, from the outset, um, you know, we can change environments now that they're built or, you know, once we've designed different spaces and people start using them, but it's a lot harder. So it's actually, you know, from the front end, being smart about the design and actually creating great places, um, you know, right, right from the get go. So um, just to recap, so yes, design theory storming, we talked about the six different theories, but we welcome you to, you know, kind of bring in other theories that you've used in practice or that you're, um, you know, some of you are probably researchers. So any, any other theories that you think are appropriate, I think, you know, this is sort of just a framework and we want people to sort of make it their own. So, and make it the most useful for the projects that they have. So now we actually wanted to open it up for discussion and we wanted to talk a little bit about what, you know, could be the next steps, where to from here, um, you know, what our plans are, but also what other people we wanted to open it up and have a discussion. And Tobias, did you, were you going to say something? Say something about what? Sorry? No, you, I thought you were raising your hand. Did you want to say? No, 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 no. I was just like um, playing with my pen. No. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to say, actually, uh, Yen Lin is now in. So she, she, we can tell her now, congratulations, you won the book. Hey, I just saw she, she um, um, sent the link. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. So basically, we, we based it on, you know, we randomly looked at all the people who had done to the first three, and then assumed that, you know, that person would go to the fourth. So yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so yeah, Lin Yan's there. So she wins. Well done. And yeah, I know about your Singapore are really good about creating, um, you know, uh, um, incentives for green spaces. What are you, the city? Hang on, a garden in a city. That's your, pro that's your thing. Yes, yes, you. Sorry, she's on chat saying, oh my God, me. Yes, it is you. Oh, that's so nice. <laughs> you just need to message us your, your address or email us your address so we can, um, um, yeah, um, uh, send it to you. Great. Well, congratulations. Yes. Um, okay. So, yeah. So, let's open it up for some discussion. So, if you have any specific questions, um, you can put them in the chat or you're welcome to sort of raise your hand and, you know, actually, we can have a discussion. Um, but we do want to talk about sort of next steps. And as Yvonne and I have mentioned, we are writing a, a next book and it's about sort of looking at spaces that are not designed well, sort of sort of the, um, the unremarkable. Square, yeah, unremarkable spaces that are all around us and actually redesigning those. And it's not necessarily, um, we're not going to reapply theory storming necessarily, but it's about using nudge theory and making it again for sustainability, health and well-being, all of those different topics are still critical. Um, so that, that's one thing that we're going to be working on. Um, we would love to invite everybody to send us photos of spaces. I, some people already have, and that's awesome. So we, we've gotten a few um, people interested, and um, I think that, yeah, we, we definitely are always keen on getting more input from people. Um, 
And then, um, and Shelly just put in that you can um, send things to the design lab um, email address. Um, but we were also thinking that perhaps maybe a follow up webinar in um, maybe February. Uh, we're almost at the end of the year, which is crazy. And we, 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 we talked about whether to do it this year or early next year. I feel like the, this year is just going to fly by <laughs> at this point. Um, so perhaps in February, if, if people are keen, and we would obviously advertise this, um, a follow-up webinar to maybe a debate of some kind where we actually could challenge, um, you know, talk, talk about, you know, is this a good thing? Like spaces that are designed, how can we actually approach it in a different way? Um, can we apply theory storming? We'd love to hear, you know, people who have actually applied it to sort of evaluate spaces or even just talk about different spaces that are around them that, um, you know, they were all accessing or in different countries or wherever and um, talk about whether this is a feasible approach and, and just sort of raise some, raise the discussion and have us um, really think more deeply about some of these topics. Deb, what about this idea like, um if we could prepare a little, little like a case study template to send out to people that then can, you know, like Healthy Active by Design, they have like a template to mm -hmm. actually be promoted on their website. I think it's similar, because I think that would be a great, nearly like another addition to this book, or it could be like a, a separate document anyway. If we would get from a few people like a case study on a project where they applied it and then because you have done it obviously on a let's say a park with some of these ideas you have done it on the green roof now and things like that but if we get actually practical designs where people then used it i think that would be unbelievable that would be a great oh, that would be awesome. if anyone actually oh if anyone actually does use it let us know and we'll interview you and we'll do a whole book about it and we can do case studies that sounds fun um, i think that would be fantastic yeah yeah um, we were thinking, Toby, some kind of like a controversial debate on something, like, and not super controversial, yeah, you know, kind of controversial, like, I don't know. Well, well I, I like that. I think here in Australia, it's funny that you say that, Ivan. I think it's, um, we, are ve we are very polite here. Like in, in Germany, when you do, and you present something, people tell you, well, this can't be right. And they, there's always like <laughs> proper. Fun. So I think we could do this design theory storm and we actually put different hats on and then yeah. we have to fight for our position. So sometimes even in the ridiculous and say, nah, 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 we can't do that because of the koalas. And or like, you know, like you have real discussions about things and, and maybe again with this different head on, that could yeah. be cool. So I can really be a very bad German and just stick to my uh, position there. So that could be something fun to do. Yeah, we still think of a topic, do you know what I mean? Or yeah, mm. and, and, and we'd love other people to participate and be panelists or um, if people want to do something that would be really cool, just reach out to us. Well, one of the topics we could, I mean, obviously um, public space is evolving right now and the use of public space because of the pandemic. So maybe we could bring in something about um, the evolving use of public space or I'm not sure because it, it's sort of general we don't, at this point, we still don't know what's happening, so that's a, a difficult one. But it could it could involve kind of. Um, I've often thought I love that, Jeb. I've often thought um, I don't know how to put this in words, but something like if you could if you live in a nice place with like nice parks and playgrounds, you should actually pay a lot more taxes, like a big levy, so that everybody else has the same enjoyment. Do you know what I mean? Like I, I think of the people in Melbourne that only go in a 5k radius. That's great if you're right by these really great places. But what if you live in not not a very nice, well resourced place? So I know you I know that you do pay more rates and things like that, but some kind of massive levy so that we had a more equitable built environment. I don't know how to how you would how you put that in words, mm -hmm. you know. But, well, yeah. What are you saying? So you think like people that have nice parks should pay more? Yeah, a lot more. So that then people who don't have nice parks can have nice parks. Would they or wouldn't they? Because I think that's always that, that's a good point because um, like, that, that's a hard thing. I, I found like there's some some areas that were beautiful and once we came there and we invest all these things, suddenly it became unaffordable. So the people had to move out of the space. So it has... The opposite then as well. So, well, I'm, I'm, I lived here like for 20 years and just that because somebody invested into a park, now I suddenly, and I can't afford it, so I have to move away from this beautiful environment. So, that's yeah, I mean, that's true. 
Yeah, like the Lindsay's saying, oh, it's reflected on land prices. Yeah, I know. So I, I haven't really thought that out very well, but I'm a great believer that we need more equitable, better green spaces. Um, yeah. Yeah, and that happened at the high line. That's exactly right. But yeah. maybe that's actually, that means it's a good um, topic for a debate because there's so many pros and cons and so many, it's very complex. It's not an easy thing to, I don't know, resolve. Mm. But looking mm. at you know different different things that have happened in different areas and why and but I I, I they have been doing some research I think um, I was part of a working group in um, there were some women in Canada who had done some research already on public space and um, had found like people in apartment buildings are a lot worse off and um, you know different things like that so maybe but you know by the beginning of next year we might have some more information about kind of what's happening and the reality of what people are doing another thing would be really that would be probably a bit weird but also cool this whole idea of gamification oh, I love and because uh, i think that would be a really good debate as well like how do we bring like as i said i'm not really into innovation and like all this technology stuff but obviously it's huge so how do we tackle that and how can we nearly use a project like that and do then the design theory storming exercise mm -hmm. on that and what are the benefits? And I could, maybe that could be a very good controversial discussion as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Has anyone got any questions? A few, not really questions, there's some comments in the chat. Um, uh, and yeah, Yvonne and I can, we can work on a template, I think, yeah. for the theory storming process. I mean, there is sort of in the book, but um, maybe a little more of framework-y. Um, yeah, actually, Simon's made a really good point that, um, so true, Simon. So he's, he's doing a project about uh, community, edible community gardens um, and how they start off well, but then people just run out of steam. You know, they just die away because there's a lack, yeah, you want it to be sustainable. Um, that's with any project, isn't it really, guys? But I think there's, um, again, community consultation. That's a hard one, isn't it? Like community consultation normally never really works, I guess. Like it's, it's more community engagement that works. Like when you get the, and, and that's a hard thing sometimes when we do the master plan engagement, it's too long. And then exactly that happens. Like the whole enthusiasm, like I'm coming, I spent my whole Saturday there, I have all these ideas and then I hear nothing for three years. And then I go like, well, What's this all about? So I think I love what David Engwich is doing there with the seven day um, makeover. Yeah. So where you go there and seven days later, actually you see, wow, our town center has physically changed. There's suddenly like pot plants there and little decks and stuff and that really gets the momentum. So I think this whole idea of tactical urbanism in um, being part of this community engagement is, is really important to make that happen. And uh, but it need to, needs to be embraced by the higher levels again to really follow through with that. And it needs to be with boards. Um, sorry, yeah. it's a bit of echo feedback. Um, so I did some projects, of course, Aged Keep, this was Retirement Village, right? And there was a conversation there about a community garden, and but the Retirement Village residents would have to lead it and coordinate it. And they're all like, you know what? Nah, can't be bothered done this enough in my life can't be bothered with interpersonal conflicts and challenges and i just really don't want to do that so that's the challenge really simon is that you know people have to have the energy enthusiasm the time and then sort of the interpersonal fortitude um, to, to 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 maintain those really important community um, um gardens actually yeah can you send uh toby allison did you see that in chat seven day makeover yeah. seven day makeover is really great um, so it's yeah, it's fantastic, and he has a really good book. It's actually one of my favorite books from David Engwich. It's called The Mental Speed Bumps, and it's it's just like you read it in like an hour, but it's just full of really good thought provocation to actually change an unremarkable space as a as a street is. So that's cool. Hey, Alison, here it is. <laughs> it's a bit like your front lad. Yes, I thought I might as well. <laughs> yeah, please, anyone else pump into, jump in too. Actually, maybe that's what should that should be. Maybe we should get David, and we that's what we do our first debate on. Why aren't we? Why aren't there more seven day makeovers? Do you know what I mean, or something yeah, like that? I think that's a very good idea. Awesome. Yeah, yeah he would love that. Yeah. Because you you had a webinar or a seminar last year, Deb, and David spoke at that, didn't they? I, I yeah, the playable that. urban design workshop. Um, it was an all-day thing, but yeah, he came and was one of the speakers. 
Mm. It was really, yeah, it was really inspiring what he talked about. So we could, we could definitely kind of talk about that. And uh, Belinda had said um, something about um, play at all ages is interesting, something that can be brought to the forefront of design into uh, generational play. So maybe that could be part of the discussion as well, since we're all sort of working in that space. Well, I think that fits great to this intergeneration, but also, as you said, playable urban design. And that nearly goes towards your new book there as well, because again, streets are really unremarkable and could be utilized differently. So it's all inter intervened. And the other thing that David English, we had a um, session there last week, he's doing this other project, it's called Private Land for Public Good. So a really good thought provocation as well, where he turned his backyard into a public park and council totally freaked out first. But then actually the, the counselor came to the opening and really loved it now. So it's like, how do we challenge, I guess, some of the um, restrictions we have within our planning scheme as well to make it, to create a better community for all. Brilliant. Yes, yes. sounds good. <sighs> I think we might have run out of steam. <laughs> Any other questions? Anyone? Fourth week. Yeah. <laughs> wow. And also school holidays and all that. <laughs> COVID. <laughs> okay, okay. Actually, let's get an update on COVID in Melbourne from Alison, our Melbourne correspondent. Oh, oh like a, goodness. Like a I don't know. Yeah. Well, what's happening my, down in Melbourne? Well, my kids are not on the list to go back to school. So, so that's, that's really good. <laughs> What do you have to do to be on the list? Well, it's um, if they seven to ten, yeah, seven to ten. They um, we have to wait and see when they can go back. Mm. So my kids have just started. Well, one's in year seven, one's in year ten. So we have to wait and see what happens there. But oh, um, yeah. at least the weather's improving and people are feeling a little bit more positive. Um, yeah, we just got to try and um, hold steady and and go from there but um yeah i can start going out because i work on my own yeah so it's the sole traders so i can actually start going out and seeing what nursery stocks are available so that i can actually start getting plants into the ground so we'll just see how we go gotta have a, a covid safe plan gotta have a permit gotta oh my goodness sometimes you just think oh, i'll just stay inside here <laughs> But you must be ready to go out though, right? Yes, yeah. Out. Yeah, no, I am. I'm ready, ready to go out, but I've just got to make sure that I do everything properly. Mm. Yeah, so, we had to go through that here in terms of having the COVID safe plan and really look yeah. at all our spaces and everything. So, yeah. yeah. So I think once you've done it once or twice, then after that, it's easy. It's just change. I think change is the, the biggest hurdle. Mm. For, for everyone is is just trying to adapt adapt or die yeah but, and <laughs> it's true <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. so, but anyway we'll we'll get there um i'm looking forward to seeing my clients when i can so that'll be really good yeah <laughs> anyway it's okay i'm still smiling that's good that's yes good. and i'll look forward to reading your book Great. And, Thank you. Um, so that'll be very good. And um, everyone's still enjoying the little miniature houses out the front of the oh, house. Good. <laughs> awesome. That's great. Yeah. So they haven't been stolen or anything. So it just shows. Very good. Mm. Very good. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is cool. Another Megan's and her daughter's in Melbourne. This other oh, spoon community. Sorry, spoon oh. community. Yes, it's so cute. I haven't seen that. I have to Google that. That is super cute. Yeah, it's oh. fantastic. Yeah, th that goes everywhere now, isn't it? Oh, like they all that? do it. So it's uh, yeah, it's really nice. They all take their spoons and then they make like little miniature worlds and stuff like that to bring smiles into people's faces and stuff. Oh. So it's uh, it's pretty yeah. cute. But I think that's also always isn't it saying, like a... saying um, everyone's welcome. Like it's mm. a inclusive little thing. So it's it's very beautiful. Oh, these yeah. are cute. Hang on, I just found one. There's Hang significance on. in the spoon. The fact What's that you know the spoon. Is the spoon itself symbolic of something? Like, yes. Yeah. So I think it? it's a person or it could be anything, a feeling or. Oh, I meant like, is, it, is a spoon like mean something? No, mean something? no I, don't I, don't know. Know. I don't know. I don't know. 
Yeah, I think it was more, yeah, I don't, I don't know actually who came up with it, I think. Someone, in the, UK, in, someone in the UK, according to this. Oh, okay, yeah. It makes you smile though, using a spoon. Oh, I <laughs> use nail varnish. That is cool. Get your nail polish out and do something. Oh, I've been looking for a hobby. Maybe I could be a spoon maker. <laughs> Start up Spoonville. Yes. Oh, yeah, the painted <laughs> rocks, actually. Yeah, Anna, I've been thinking about doing that too, doing the painted rocks, actually, as a little hobby. Mm. I bought a little kit. Um, I'll share my screen. Okay, hang on. I'll share my screen, show people the picture. Good, thank you. Shelly, my lab coordinator, is saying, share the screen. So here you are, everybody. See, how cool is that? Yeah, that? yeah, that's so yeah. cool. I've been, that's so cool. Yeah, this is whole tactical ur urbanism, um, isn't it? That kind of, uh, at, a, at a resident participant level, it's so great. Well, I think that, that really what the um, coronavirus did as well, so many people had actually barbecues uh, in their front garden and things like that just to engage somehow, wasn't it? Like, um, yeah. it was beautiful to see too. I've never, again, when we were, in, I've never seen so many people with their dogs. I don't know what they did with yeah, their dogs no, before. Same. And suddenly it's like everybody in the street with their dog. And I said, well, what did you do before? Did the dog never get out or what? It's like crazy. <laughs> but it was no, nice. Like now you know everybody actually. It's, um, yeah. That was a nice thing about it, wasn't it? But, but I, think, I don't know about you. I, I started scootering like with my kids in the afternoon because I was at home. So we'd go for like a scooter or a bike ride down to the park. Actually, I'm going to try and do that this afternoon as well because I'm home today. But yeah, because you had that more, more time. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Actually, maybe that could be the debate. I think, you know, should we legislate a four day work week to engage, to have, to make people have healthy lifestyles and activate and active spaces or something? Like, I think if we did something like that, if we changed, you know, I don't know, something about do we keep, how can we? take the positives of COVID, which is that, yeah. you know, mm. and the impacts on public space. Um, I do, and, and look how much less um, traffic we had and all that. So look how much time we waste sitting in the car to just go to sit in an office. And we did it before from home and it all worked. Like we were all right. still busy. We all got our things done. Mm. But I think that's the hardest thing, as Alison said, that like people are scared of change. Yeah. And that's what, what happens. Like, look at all the farmers. I loved it last night. It was an ABC, like... Um, um, about regenerate, uh, regenerative um, farming and stuff like that. But again, like, oh, this is different. And people are like, no, no, we always did it like that. We always chased the water table. We just bore a little bit deeper to get the water. Well, that's not a sustainable solution. So at some point we have to open up for that and go like, what are, what are different methods and how do we embrace them? And yes, it will take some time. We probably don't make a profit straight away, but we will get there in a more um, responsible manner, I guess. Yeah. Oh, the Regina farming. Awesome. Well, I think we might have come to an end. Have yeah. we? Ended? What do you think, Toby? Yeah. yeah, I think that's uh, was fun, guys. It thank was you. fun. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Yay. Yeah, thank you, everyone. <laughs> There's pros and cons of being virtual. The pros is that everybody can be there. The con is that you're not, you can't have those conversations that you would normally have afterwards with people over a cup of coffee or a glass of wine or food. Yeah, we, do, we do that. We do that maybe in February. Maybe we yeah, can actually, have like, uh, yeah. actually, that's a good idea. If, yeah. if it's all open up so we can get some people from not Brisbane to Zoom in, but maybe yep. the others, we can get a little room and sit together. Actually, that would be beautiful. Isn't yeah. it funny? We now think that's exciting. Like, yeah, it's, exciting. <laughs> it's the so small weird. things that count now. Right? <laughs> it's the small things. Oh my god. <laughs> oh, uh, uh, my friend Shelly said, bring your own spoon. So, my lab coordinator. So, she'll get this uh, we could actually de decorate our own spoon. Actually, we could do like a debate about that tactical urbanism. How can we be the change we want to see? And maybe we could paint our own rocks or bring our own spoon or I don't know. Right, we have to think of something. Yeah. Awesome. We'll be on it. Challenge. <laughs> uh, and Lynn, we're going to send you a book. Okay. So, um, you know, send your address to us. Well done. Yeah, that would be great. Happy to come to Singapore. Would love yeah, that. always. Yes. Because, um, <laughs> yes. Singapore is the, um, as soon as we can uh, travel. I'll be yeah, yeah, no plastic spoons. We're going to the spoon making business. Because it's been off. One uh, thing I did notice in the parks is um, the spoonvilles are in like little glades in amongst trunks and stuff like that. So the kids are choosing their places in these little refuge areas, which is really nice. So it actually makes kids want to go out through the park. 
and then uh, yeah and then in our area there's been a big uproar because uh, the little boys uh, not just boys but girls as well were building their own jump things for bmx tracks uh -huh. in the in the <laughs> reserves and then the council knocked them down <laughs> oh wow. And then the, the youngest, one of the teenage young kids, I think he wasn't even a teenager, he actually took um, the council um, uh, on. And um, so now the council sent through a letter saying these are the things we need to discuss about where we can actually put um, these BMX tracks in the reserves now because the kids have actually been very active in showing their disapproval. That's great. Can you, have you got a link to that? Can you send that to us, Alison? Yeah, I love that. a piece of paper somewhere. I can easily scan it and send it through because yeah, it was a letter a from the council. Because yeah. yeah. that's a really great example of like, you know, kids actually, Please. you know, yeah, creating an environment that they want. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and also forcing it through. Yeah. yeah. Their voice. Yeah. <laughs> So That's good on awesome. him. I know the kid because he keeps driving past, going past on his bike past my place. So when I'm in my garden, I see him going and I'm thinking, oh, someone's going to run him over because he's a real uh, dangerous kid. Oh, no. <laughs> so he doesn't watch where he's going. But anyway, he um, He's a real activist. I love it. <laughs> he's a real activist. But they, and they, they made their own jumps using off cuts of PVC pipe and bamboo and then putting the clay around them. And so, yeah, so that was, uh, I was really sad to see it had been knocked down because they'd actually, and I didn't take a photo either, but it was actually quite um, clever. Hey, but, Alison, do you, do, you, do you live in the morning peninsula? No, I live in Ringwood North. So, oh, because that sounds like my, my sister-in-law, her son, like he's like, he always sends me photos, like he, he's doing all exactly that. And he could be the yeah. crazy kid passing your window, but uh, <laughs> I guess it's not him then. <laughs> no, it's not him. So this is the Marunda. You might be able to find it on the um, internet. I'm not quite sure, but it's the Marunda City Council. Um, and then I live next to JB Hubbard, Hubbard Reserve. Um, well, on the footpath towards it. So we get a lot of traffic it's kids terrific. going up to the reserve. And that's one of the things was this bike thing as well. And Spoonville's there and it's a dog park. So the green space is actually just a big open field with a little gazebo in it, and it will, everybody walks their dogs to go and off the lead and catch bull there. So there's a lot of good things about that small reserve. So I think Claire just made the point on our Megan about um, take, yeah. kids taking the streets back. And I, I love that. Maybe that could be a frame for a, a February conversation. Yeah. Mm. So less traffic, more kids. Yeah, right. Because I've noticed that too. Uh, like during a Brisbane lockdown, there, there were more people on the streets. Like you said, Toby, there were more people walking dogs, but not so much anymore. Do you know what I mean? No. It's changed. Yeah. It was normal. Quick. It was quick you know? back to normal, isn't it? Really yeah, quick. Absolutely. Really quick. I, I, yeah. I did talk to a lot of people and they said like in places they've clo closed off, well, maybe during the heart, and this was in the US, they closed off streets to cars to allow more public space. Yeah. But I don't think they did that here in Brisbane much. No, like, not at all. I, don't think I know of. But I think, I, I really think again, like, um, as I said, in Germany, I grew up in a play street and all that stuff. It doesn't need to be fully um, closed, yeah. closed. Like, I think it's, it's, and, and that's the thing with this mental speed bumps as well. The more people are on the streets, then pe the, the cars drive automatically slow. You don't need a, a, yeah. a speed bump. So it's, I think it's, it's again, common sense bringing it all back. But I have to say as well, in my neighborhood, my kids, like, my, they are always out there. But some of my neighbor's kids, they're actually hanging at the, at the fence, overlooking, and the parents don't let them out. They are so scared. And I'm like, yeah, let them out. No, no, no. They have to play in the backyard. And... So how do we actually, it, it, it's just so ingrained in us now, this fear that somebody could drive into them. So, but again, and, and the streets are not designed for it either. So where I lived before, there was no footpath, no nothing. So you came out of the front and boom, you were on the street, like there was nothing else. So I think that's again, the responsibility from us, how we design this, I guess this therapy is, isn't it? Mm. Right. Oh, God, I love, I love the chat. So cool. Um, so there's heaps of stuff here about, so Play Australia are trying to get a thousand play streets as part of their strategy. It's been clear. And then Anna from Queensland Walk was saying that she actually tried to engage Brisbane City Council for temporary closures during COVID. That was great trying. 
Anna. Mm. Yeah. Oh, great trying. It, yeah, it's really hard. And it, Brisbane City Council do, do, do some things extremely well, like their light strategy and things like that. Like the, you know, what's, I've forgotten what it is. What's it? It's called like a strategy to light up Brisbane or something. Oh, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, but then they're not doing some other, but they're not the most, sometimes in terms of really pushing the boundaries, we're not, they're not doing that. We need to push them to push the boundaries. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah, let's. I like the idea of taking the streets back. I'm going to try and write that down. Oh, cool. Um, I just. Oh no, I just sniffed. I hope I don't have a cold. Kind of feels like a big caravan park here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the downside or the upside. <laughs> yeah, because you know when you go into these caravan parks, so obviously I I noticed because I didn't grow up where we could go to caravan parks and stuff like that. It wasn't this different, um, and. Uh, yeah, the kids, like you have the five kilometre rule in a caravan park where you go slow. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it kind of feels like now the kids are out on the street. So you do generally adopt the same rules as in the caravan park. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now I know what you mean. You're right. The, yeah, the drive slow. Yes. <laughs> Too funny. Okay, I've written down taking the streets back. I'll, we'll try and we'll, we'll try and do something for... Um... Oh, yeah, I think I've seen some of that doco. Mm. We'll try and do something in, in, in um, February. There's also yeah. Logan, Logan Together, like the ex-head um, um, of Nature Place, now the head of um, Logan Together. So they're doing a lot more like um, um, playable neighborhoods focus as well and loose play and stuff. So there's a few good movements out there. I think it's yeah, just how do we make that nearly like a no-brainer that all the new developments have to have that. I think that's where we need to be. Oh, um, can I just comment to the chat too? Anna's talking about, um, uh, from Queensland Walks, about wanting to do that child-led walkability audit. Actually, Anna, you and I would need to talk sooner rather than later. So in my other hat uh, as Director of the Design Lab, we've got a partnership with uh, Queensland Health looking at redesigning hospitals for the future. And one of the things we were talking about was better linking Queensland Children's Hospital with South Bank, because if you think about it, they're actually not, it's not linked very well together. So maybe we could do, we could start, some child-led walkability tours there, starting with um, kids in hospital or people visiting that hospital, how we fix that a little bit, maybe. I'm trying to link together 7,000 existing projects. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a hard thing. <laughs> but yeah, let's have a combo. Okay, okay. I'm gonna Thank go you. and do some work. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, everyone. everyone. Good Thanks. luck in Melbourne. <laughs>